My name is Paul, I'm the ranger for the Wilding Waterhall project on the outskirts of Brighton and Hove. Um, this is a, an incredibly exciting uh, new project um, as part of the Changing Chalk project which is a heritage lottery funded project running right across the South Downs with lots of different initiatives uh, and this one the Wilding Waterhall project is essentially a rewilding project but with some some nice bits of flexibility in, in the, the parameters of what we can do here um, and we're right on the urban fringe we've got the sea only a couple of miles away and we've got the connectivity with the wider downs stretching north and uh, in all directions um, uh, beyond. So Waterhall was a golf course for getting on for a hundred years in different shapes and, and, and forms um, but uh, about two years ago the golf, golf course was decommissioned um, lots of different tenders came in and the council decided to go to put in a, 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 a wilding bid and we were successful so here we are. With the history of the site Waterhall was a golf course for a long time but um, and my, my nan actually was one of the senior champions here um, so this place was quite special to me as a kid growing up and I played golf as a child myself so I played here quite a lot. This had a lovely reputation this course because it was a bit of a love-hate course. Lots of people didn't like it because it was really rugged, very up and down, a little bit unkempt in some of its management because it was a budget course but lots of people had a real aff affection for the course for those reasons um, and that was the case with our family. So my nan is, is, uh, was, was, um, was a champion here for many years and her name is on the plaques in the ladies changing room still now which is lovely for me, it feels really quite nostalgic but also very progressive um, to be able to come back to here as a, as a grown man and move forward with, with some, something completely different in the same landscape that I sort of spent time growing up in uh, which I think is really special. Well, chalk grassland is one of the richest, one of the rarest habitats in the world, actually. It's probably the fourth, fifth, fifth richest habitat in the world. It's known affectionately as a, as a rainforest in miniature. Uh, and you can find in areas like this here, on this lovely little old bunker, uh, or the mound around the outside of a green, um, you can find up to sort of 40 different plant species in a square metre, which is quite phenomenal, really. Um, and that's just species, not just numbers of plants. And all the invertebrates, um, and other organisms that are associated with each of those plants. So you're talking about a massive biomass here. Um, and you can see, just on this little tiny little bank here, there's a lovely little harebell there, there's some ladies' bed straw, there's some wild thyme. These are all really good, sort of good indicators of, of chalk grassland, um, or certainly good flower-rich grassland. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're, one of the drivers for this project is to, to restore a lot of the chalk grassland that hasn't been neglected in the same way as other sites I've managed over the years where you've, it's just become completely covered in bramble or scrub. Um, you can see here, if you look around, there's a lot of open grassland. But what you can also see, apart from this lovely little area in front of us here, is that there's not much in the way of flowers on the site. It's very, very grass rich, but it's very flower poor. And I think a lot of that is because it's been over managed as a golf course for a long time, cut w way too much really and obviously with, with pesticides would have been here as well, over irrigated, almost like a synthetic landscape. And I think that that's what we want to change here. And, and by using uh, or working with, with grazing animals, bringing them back into the landscape um, as a light touch rather than as a heavy management tool, um, we can start to restore this grassland very gradually. These things will take time and nature needs time to, to spread its wings, if you like. There's lots of different mosaics on the site already. You've got some, you've got sort of longer grass, you've got some really nice short grass, some really good chalk grass and already. Um, you've got some of the even aged um, single species scrub that we're gonna be sort of cutting into a little bit, especially where it encroaches upon the chalk grassland and is, and is sort of swallowing up the old grassland. Uh, we'll be managing some of that. Um, but a lot of the sort of uh, um, more species diverse woodland and scrub we want to encourage because, and again, um, harnessing that sort of more of a, of a rewilding philosophy, um, we want to have somewhere where the cattle can, and the other grazing animals that we'll be working with eventually, um, to be able to go and get some shade. Uh, and also that will change the sort of structure of the woodlands as well um, as the open grassland. About a year ago, very curiously, on impoverished limestone chalk grassland, we found some heather. Now some people might think so, and other people might think, well that's impossible. 
But actually, historically, we had a lot of chalk heath on the downs. Um, we don't have any, we don't have, have it in, in spades anymore at all. I think Ludington Heath is probably the best example we've got in Sussex and probably in the UK. Um, so to find a piece of wild heather, and you can see there's a few sprigs of it coming up. It's not looking in great condition, but it's still very curious and it's quite exciting because it just shows how sometimes nature can just push out um, or cling on depending on what this little sprig here is doing and what it's like, what its history has been. It is really interesting to know that, it, um, that there are plants from different pH habitats, if you like, Thri not thriving, <laughs> present here. We've got here some bramble, as you can see, being enjoyed by a skipper there, butterfly. Now, bramble's a tricky one because in the right place, like many plants, it's very welcome, it's, it's an amazing resource. It's probably our favorite wild fruit as, as, as for, for humans. Um, but it's also, I mean, the flowers are quite nectar rich. Um, it's great habitat when you get it in clumps like you can see behind us there. But these, this is quite a good example of what we don't want to encourage because you can see we've got more widely around this area, we've got chalk grass that we want to restore here. This is some of the, some of the better bits that we've got on the site that's at the beginning of the project is already here. So we will, we will want to be really, you know, trying to expand on this area and improve the area. Um, so bramble in areas like this is what we don't want to see. Here we've got a really good example of how the, the scrub, and admittedly there's some really nice mixed age, mixed species scrub here that we would normally want to encourage. And we will be doing so on most of the areas where this kind of scrub matrix is present. However, here, you can see right where I'm standing and coming to the edge here is some really good chalk grassland. There's a lovely big ant hill here, which is another good indicator of chalk grassland. And there's loads of those species that we discussed earlier, the harebells, the ladies' bed straw. Uh, there's some scabious here, look, some knapweed with a couple of six spot burnet moths. Um, so there's some lovely habitat here. And in a battle of supremacy, the scrub is gonna win every time if you let it. So this scrub 10 years ago would have been further in where that, where that um, fireweed is in there. Can you see the, uh, the pink flowers? That's probably 10 years worth of encroachment, of expansion of this scrub. And another 10 years, it's going to go to where you guys are standing now, on that path. So this little bit of grassland will be lost. And we've got to be looking at this as being an example of landscape loss, just on a tiny scale because that's what we are doing you know, gradually is losing a lot of the landscape, especially the old chalk grassland, because of, of, of just the, the wrong type of, type of management or no management at all. So when people say to you, why can't you just leave it alone? This is what happens. This scrub, this scrub doesn't have any choice. It's, it's designed to expand and to push out. Um, so we need to, 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 be, to manage that. Not, you know, not, not destroy everything and not always prioritise grass and over scrub, but, but look at balancing all the time, all the different needs of, of the habitat and the species there within as well. Behind us here, we've got really the only sort of large block of, of woodland um, rather than scrub. Um, and scrub generally is sort of more shrubby species with bramble and that sort of stuff, whereas woodland is the, is the biggest sort of stuff. There's a lot of sycamore there. There's even some wild cherry in the foreground. There's quite a lot of sort of much more mature hawthorn. There's some elm, there's some ash. There's quite a lot of species in there, but you can see it's quite established woodland and that's a, a, an amazing habitat uh, in itself. It's this big tree planting culture in this country at the moment. And, and in many ways I get that. But when you've got an area like this, that we want to exp ex expand and encourage, but not by planting trees, because when you've got this sort of seed bank, that it'll just expand itself. Just, you know, we, we'll just graze nice and lightly around the outside and when the seeds are dropping, they will start to turn into saplings. You know, they will germinate, they'll turn into small trees and which will become larger trees and the woodland can, can gradually expand itself without the need to actually, for us to come in and intervene. And I think that's quite an important message that sometimes it's okay to plant trees, but another, you know, I'd, I'd say most of the time by allowing nature to take its course you know if you leave most of us know that if you leave any piece of land eventually it will turn into woodland um, and that would be the case here and it already is the case so, so it just be by you know there'll be it's, all, it's probably another five or six hundred saplings already 
growing outside of this little woodland here. Uh, and that's, that's great to see, and that's, that's what we want to encourage here. We're at the conservation pond now, in the conservation area outside of the golf course, but inside the project. Um, we've got two areas of land that we've sort of lumped into the project from the outside to make up the 90 hectares that we'd be managing in total. Uh, and this is a, a spectacular pond most of the time, and it's still spectacular despite the fact that, as you can clearly see, it's practically empty. We've had a very, very dry summer. We're in the middle of a very dry hot spell at the moment, and all the evaporation has caused this pond has gone pretty much dry. You can see there's a slightly there's a damp area in the middle, but there's still a lot of life in there. And if you get sort of down and dirty inside the pond and get on your knees you'll, and, and, and have a look around, you'll, you'll find a lot of stuff still. There'll be a lot of invertebrate life in there. There will still be newts, frogs and toads living out their life cycle, maybe on the edges at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of marginal plant life going on as well, as well as in the pond itself despite the fact that it's actually ebbing to the point where it's almost empty. But actually, it's part of the natural life cycle of a pond, really, especially of a natural pond, um, to ebb and flow and to the peak and trough. You know, it's, it's great when it's full up, and it's also, it's okay for shortish periods of the year when it empties out to this degree. So it's not devastating, it's nothing to really worry about. There's no leak in it. Um, and you can see how also we've, protected the pond mainly from dogs running in and out which really affects the edge habitats and the which are the sort of crucial areas around the outside of the pond um, which affects the, the wildlife of the pond and sort of turns it from a wildlife pond into just a, a water source um, so it's really important that we protect the wildlife in the pond With the project looking forward, there's quite a lot of flexibility in what we can do with this project. There's not really many rewilding projects or any that I'm aware of that are based on chalk. So without sounding like we're blagging it, we can kind of make up little, you know, parts of this as we go along, which is really exciting. Um, when you have professionals with experience on site managing an area, that's a really exciting bit of, um, of, you know, of like I say, flexibility to be able to manage um, using the experience we've built up over the years as a team. Looking forward, year one, as in now, we, we've got grazing animals already on site uh, from a local farmer, which are about as close as we can get to replicating those ancient herbivores that would have been on, on the downs uh, grazing through before, both before and after people came and, and started to colonise this area. Um, we've got something called a sward enhancement plan in place now so basically I'll be working with and I've been working with local ecologists we've had so much input from so many ridiculously knowledgeable people it's almost overwhelming um, but also wonderful to have that level of, of, um, of involvement from people so to, together working with some of these ecologists we've been we've, we've, we've put together this sword enhancement plan and what that will do is is sort of eke out the the better areas of the site that we would like to manage strictly as chalk grasslands which are mainly the sort of fairways edge habitats greens and bunker areas as we saw with the thyme and the ladies bed straw on that bunker that some of those little habitats are clean on um, but there's also it's just as important to look at the areas that are not currently as good because they're the ones we want to target longer term. Um, and as I say, these things take time, but over, let's say 10 years, we'd like to see some of these areas that are quite deprived at the moment of, of, of species diversity um, improve over time. So some of the areas will, 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 we, can, we think that we can restore quite quickly and other areas um, will take time because the landscape will need to, to time to adjust to the new grazing regime, for example, um, uh, but also just yeah, just the general general way that the, the, the landscape is being managed differently. We're now towards the back of the site where we have the cattle grazing, and as I said earlier, we're introducing the cattle grazing gradually, and we chose to use the back of the site. Ecologically, it's a nice area to start as well because it's not one of our priority areas, and it's an area that we want to see improve over time. Um, as per that sward enhancement plan that we, dis that we discussed earlier. Um, but as I say, we're at the back of the site now, and as we come towards this sign here that I erected about a couple of months ago when the cows first arrived, and it says, cattle grazing ahead, you are now entering a no-fence zone. Now, a no-fence zone is the area beyond this, these signs, and I've put them on all the three pathways 
um, that go towards where the cattle are currently residing. Um, and the no fence system or the, is, is basically a, a management tool where you're using GPS collars on each of the cattle and we can use our phone apps to actually plot paddocks on our phones. Technically, we could do it from home on the sofa um, and then you can move the cows in and out of, of zones or paddocks um, and, it, and you can do it very sort of, you can do it quite randomly, you can do it reactively as to when the site requires a change. So it's much better than actually physical fencing. It works on the idea that there's an electric fence, but obviously it's a no fence. So as they're approaching the fence, rather than just getting a, a flat out shock, a little shock on their, on their neck, um, they get a warning beep as they're approaching the line and it gets continuous and louder as they approach it. And if they turn around and move away, it stops. If they don't, if they ignore that, they then get a little shock. And once they've crossed the line, it stops shocking. So they don't get any shock after that. And they don't get any shock coming back across. And the idea is that one animal might go across, but because they're a herd animal, the herd stick together and the herd might be here and one goes over and he'll always want to get back to his mates. So that's the, that's the idea behind it. They're in pasture one at the moment and we've taken down the fence effectively from pasture one and we've made pasture one part of pasture two as well. Just so that as they're wandering now, normally if they were still in pasture one, they'd be starting to get a sort of beeping around about where that first animal is and they'd know to turn around. But because I've turned, turned it so that they've got the pasture two as well, they should be able to walk across that line. And as if I was sitting in my armchair at home later tonight, I could put the line back across and they're moved. Um, so it's as easy as that really. If you look up this line from this post to the next post, you can see quite a clear line. And this is the actual boundary of the no fence paddock. And you can see quite a clear line up there where the cows have been doing their thing and grazing down not quite nicely. And as you can see, as I said earlier, it's quite light grazing. We're not, we're not looking at heavy grazing of the site. It's quite light and delicate grazing at the moment. And we'll see how the site reacts longer term as to whether it needs to be lighter or heavier and we can tailor it accordingly. So the cattle have moved from paddock one or pasture one into number two. You can see them happily grazing up there. And again, look at their behavior. They are nice and relaxed first and foremost. Um, they've been on site a few weeks now, so they're getting to know the, their surroundings. But they're also, what they're, what they're doing, they're browsing and they're grazing at the same time. So there's a couple in the bushes, grazing right into the sort of longer areas where it's gonna be pushing into sort of more brambly areas. And they'll be flattening that a little bit just having an impact on, on the, the flora along the edge habitat there. But they're also just out grazing on the grassland. And you can see quite clearly the line here between where they've been and this new savannah rich grassland they've got in front of them here. Um, and this is an example of the sort of thing that we're looking for at the moment. You can see this is quite lightly grazed. You know, when we graze important chalk grassland sites with mainly with sheep, um, we'll graze that right down. Most of the time, we'll, quite have, we'll hit it quite hard, whether by mob grazing over short periods or just by keeping the sheep on for several months. Whereas here, we don't want to do that. Uh, we will be doing that on some of the chalk grassland areas. And I think longer term, we might, be, we might use or work with sheep as well or instead. Um, but up here on these old fairways, we want to be able to see what's going to happen long term. And this is a nice sort of template to start with. A nice, easy, light graze. And we'll see how this recovers in the next couple of months through the rest of the summer, moving into the autumn, as to when we think we're gonna hit it again. We've got plenty of places elsewhere on the site to graze. Um, so we might not come back and visit this site for, you know, getting on for another year now, really. Um, none of the site has decayed or is in, it has, you know, is, is in, um, is deprived enough for us to really worry about when we do it. So we can just sort of just gradually move around the site and just seeing how each piece of the, the site responds to grazing. Volunteering is, is a crucial part of the success of the project really uh, going forward. Um, and I've been working with volunteers for about 15 years now and, and most of them have become my friends um, because of the shared, the obvious shared interest, but also because I've just got so much respect for people that just go out of their way in their own time to, for nothing, in a, you know, financially for nothing. I'm sure everybody gets lots of lots from what they do in various ways. 
Um, but just coming out and giving their time is, is a really admirable thing to do. Um, and lots of people just don't find the time these days. And it's, it's still amazing that there are lots of people that do just invest that time and give back to their local green spaces, for example. Uh, and there's loads of opportunities in a project like this. Um, there's all the practical conservation work we can carry out with all the sort of the, uh, the burning of the scrub, the cutting and burning of the scrub in the winter, um, especially in the first few years when we're trying to sort of sculpt the, some of the scrub areas. And then obviously we'll just let the livestock take over a little bit longer term. Uh, but creating these sort of templates is really important at this stage uh, and volunteers will be crucial there. But also with the lookering, which is the volunteer shepherds. I um, don't know whether we can still call them shepherds when we've got cattle, but we'll have to think of some, some other new, strange, crazy name. Um, and also you know, monitoring and recording is a really important part of the ongoing um, success of the project. So teaching people how to, so if, if you get people that, for example, if you've got guided walks that you're putting on and you get five or six people that have expressed an interest in learning more about butterflies for example then we can put people on a butterfly uh, transit training scheme for example or I can go out and just, and just take people out for an afternoon uh, learning about sort of more the sort of natural history of butterflies but also about recording and how important it is and the methodology and all that kind of stuff that's involved as well. There's loads that people can get involved in and demographic wise although most people that volunteer I think probably because of time are retirees. That's not actually the case in places like Brighton being quite an anomaly having so much urban fringe. There's a lot of working professionals that love volunteering because it provides that lovely contrast to their sort of urban lifestyles, you know, graphic designers for example, and then coming out at the weekends or in the evenings to volunteer. Um, so there's a, there's a wide demographic of people and everybody benefits from volunteering in different ways. Obviously we're hugely grateful for the extra support uh, but we hope that people are a coming on the journey with us and be learning loads and then acting as sort of secondary ambassadors or even primary ambassadors for us and, and showcasing and championing what we're doing here um, with their own communities. So the word, it just helps spread the word even more and it just becomes this massive sort of integrated community of people constantly growing, um, spreading this lovely message. We want people to come on this journey with us, so that's really important. Um, so we've already got a, a, a quite significant volunteer army already built up over the last few months. We've been running launch events, we've, we've been running volunteer sessions through the winter. So we've already been taking part in some, in some scrub clearance. Um, there's some larger scale scrub clearance coming on this winter. Um, and again, that will require lots of volunteer support. Um, as I've mentioned about the, the professionals coming in and helping us with survey work, with, with quantifying the value of the site early on, so that we can start to record the success as we move forward. But also on a day-to-day -day level, it, the management of the site will depend quite heavily on, on how people respond to this project, who are using the site every day and enjoying the site every day. And that at the moment is mainly the people with dogs, dog walkers. Um, and obviously that, everyone's welcome on the site. It's an open site, it's public statutory open access land. We're just designating it a local nature reserve. Um, so yeah, that's really important to stress that we win this isn't an insular project, this is, this is something we want, we want people to come here, as many people as possible. But dog walking or dogs uh, by design are, our quite, are probably our biggest challenge, if you like, for the, on, on the site. Um, and that's because dogs, uh, by the way that they behave, have quite a heavy impact on wildlife in the, in the numbers that we've been seeing here at Waterhall. And that's been you know, up to a thousand dogs on a daily basis up here. Um, now for me that's quite an unsustainable level, despite being a, a dog lover myself, I've got to look at this project and see how we can harness the best from it and I think that we would like to see, I think we, probably like, I think we will naturally see less dogs here because there are going to be cattle on site, but we also want people to understand the project rather than resent it. Um, so again, engagement is really important with this, so be working really hard with the, the communities already using this space. Um, to try and educate people as to why this is not just about a single agenda. This is about a much, this is much wider. This is about people. This is about wildlife, and the wider landscape and the connectivity with, you know, connecting the city and the downs. Hello, I'm Theoni. I'm a chalk life ranger with the Changing Chalk Project, which is led by the National Trust. The Changing Chalk Partnership came about when 
a lot of different organisations all got together. So the National Park, the National Trust obviously that led the project, um, Bug Life and uh, the, the Brighton Hope Food Partnership, some of the councils, everyone came together and said look we need to help the Downs in some way, we need to help them to be managed better so that we keep this amazing chalk grassland and so that we so that we um, restore some more of it because some of it's being lost. People think that all the downs are chalk grassland, you see all these lovely hills, but actually only 4% is chalk grassland, it's very rare. The different partners between them are, over the next four years, we're going to help people to understand the history of the downs. It has a very long history of people living here and working here, right back to Neolithic times, but also the the amazing grassland, the flowers and everything that we've looked at is only here because it's grazed. It's grazed by cattle and sheep and if you stop grazing we lose it. So we lose it to scrub and bushes and bramble and things like that. Um, but a lot of it since the war has also been lost to other types of farming. If you plough it or fertilise it, it's lost. You can't get it back. Well you can but it takes a long time. So the place that I'm sitting has been grazed for hundreds of years. We don't know it might have been grazed for thousands of years. Um, and a place like Waterhall, where they're trying to get the chalk grassland back, you can get it back, but it's a long process of grazing and managing it right. We're out here on a really, really lovely bit of chalk grassland that is absolutely full of different plants and mosses and fungi and flowers and insects. Um, and we know that it's good quality chalk grassland, that it's very old chalk grassland, that it's been grazed for hundreds of years. And we know it because there are so many different plants here. And I don't know if you want to come and have a look at some of them, but I can see a lot of different plants down here. This is wild thyme. This is milkwort. These are all chalk grassland plants. This one is milkwort. This is bird's foot trefoil. This one is squiancy wort. Ooh, that's a nice word. Uh, this one here is round-headed rampion. That's called the Pride of Sussex. That's a real classic chalk grassland one. And we've got some orchids. This is pyramidal orchid and some really nice grasses. This grass is called quaking grass and you can see it quakes. It's another chalk grassland indicator species. What else have we got? Have I said horseshoe vetch? This is the food plant of the Adonis blue butterfly, which is one of our iconic chalk grassland butterflies. Oh, and there's one here, eye bright. That's one that people used to crush and put in their eyes. Not something you'd want to do now, but apparently it made your eyes bright. There's a lot of different things up here. It's not just the, the flowers and the plants and the insects and the butterflies, which of course there are. There's also uh, lizards and snakes and there's a load of different birds. You'll often see swifts overhead, yellow hammers. They're birds that like the downland. So it's getting the balance right between things like scrub and trees and opened chalk grassland is very important. And some of what the, the partners in the Change in Chalk project are doing are facilitating that, helping that, making that happen, getting that balance right. And across the wider landscape as well, some parts of the project are, they may not be creating direct, biodiverse, really rich chalk grassland, but the connecting habitat, because the chalk grassland is so fragmented, we've got these small pieces left, to connect them up, even with habitat that may not be pure and perfect chalk grassland, but is good for insects and good for animals to move through getting between pieces of chalk grass and that's also part of the project. There's some parts of the project that are creating connecting habitat, not always, always just going for the chalk grassland. So if this area wasn't grazed by 
livestock, if there were no sheep and cattle grazing this grassland, it would be, it would just fill up with bramble and then bushes and it would all completely disappear. All these amazing plants, all the rare insects, all the things that love chalk grassland, they disappear. So we need the grazing. We really need the cattle and the sheep. And of course, the people that graze the cattle and the sheep are farmers. This is a difficult place to farm. It's not, it's not easy for farmers to just let the cattle out, let the sheep out, and, and they've got plenty to eat because this is actually not very nutrient rich. And as we said earlier, if you put fertilizer on chalk grassland, you lose all the flowers. So out on the downs, there's a load of different wildlife. It's not just the flowers, which are amazing. There's a lot of different insects. So of course the butterflies, the iconic butterflies, the blue butterflies, the Adonis blue, the chalk hill blue that, that live out here and the marbled whites. But there's also a lot of different beetles and hoverflies, there's lizards and snakes, there's skylarks, you often hear skylarks up here, there's swifts that you'll get soaring overhead, yellowhammers love the downs, there's a lot of different wildlife and it all comes together in this beautiful downland landscape. Chalk grassland is it's important on so many levels. With climate change, we're going to be losing nature. We know that. We know that as the climate changes, there's things that won't be able to live where they live. Um, so the more nature, the more different habitats we've got as climate change happens, the better chance we've got of nature being able to adapt. Restoring and keeping the chalk grassland that we've got is very important as climate change happens. All the habitats that we can keep, the more nature we have before climate change gets going, the more we've got a chance to have as it progresses. If you want to help to look after the chalk downland, there are certain things that really do help. Because, because this type of grassland is farmed, this is a farmed landscape, there are farmers that that we need to keep this grazed um, in order for it to keep it full of the amazing life that there is here. So if you're out walking on the downs, look at all the beauty that there is here. But if you've got your dog with you, also look out for the farm animals. Keep your dog on a lead um, and stick to the paths. If you want to get involved in the Changing Chalk Partnership, there's going to be various ways. There's, there's going to be um, ways to volunteer practical volunteering, there'll be various events, uh, ways to learn about the downs, um, there's, a, 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 there's a dig going on, there's a whole archaeological project going on, as well as uh, helping to survey, learning about the plants, that kind of thing. All over the downs you see relationships going on where creatures depend on each other and depend on human beings. So, Ant hills, um, the Adonis blue butterfly, which is this vibrant blue butterfly that lives on the chalk, it needs ants because it's, it's caterpillars, the, the little grubs. They need to be looked after by the ants and they secrete a little sugary liquid and the ants love this and they protect the caterpillar. But the ant hills wouldn't be here if the land wasn't grazed. So the ants need people to keep their animals on the downs so that the grass stays short enough and the ground is warm enough for the ants to live and make ant hills. So there's relationships that go on. One depends on another and another depends on another. Without the ants, there would be no Adonis blue butterflies. And without people grazing the downs and keeping it short, the ants wouldn't be able to live here.